Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. In recognizing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's spiritual and cultural connection to country, I just want to commence the meeting by acknowledging the first peoples and the traditional owners and custodians of the country where we're all located this morning. For me, that's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We respectfully acknowledge our elders past and present and remember that they have passed on their wisdom to us in various ways. Let us hold this in trust as we work and serve our communities. For those who don't know me, my name is Charlie Young and I'm a PhD candidate at Australian Catholic University. I'm studying um, kind of at the intersections of migration and health. And I'm really pleased to be able to chair this event for you today in my role as a postgrad committee member of the Migration, Ethnicity and Multiculturalism thematic group at the Australian Sociological Association. So there's a few acronyms, we're known as TASA's Next Gen Mem. I'm thrilled to welcome you all this morning to this instalment in our Conversations About series. Today, we're gonna to be discussing interdisciplinary migration research and some of the challenges that we might face uh, as emerging scholars in this space. The event is produced in collaboration with the Research Centre for Refugees, Migration and Humanitarian Studies at Australian Catholic University and the Comparative Network on Refugee Externalisation Policies, also known as CONREP. And we're very grateful for the support provided by them. We've got a fantastic lineup of speakers for you today and we'll be using a slightly different format to our previous events in the series. So I'll just quickly let you know the plan and we can get the housekeeping out of the way. So first up, we'll be hearing from our three esteemed panelists who I'll introduce in just a moment. They'll be outlining some of the key challenges facing interdisciplinary migration researchers, and they might even draw, if we're lucky, on their own experiences to help us consider how we might overcome some of the challenges um, as emerging scholars. And then following them, we've got five minutes um, of presentations each from Hao Zeng, Carl Anderson, and Marina Khan, who are going to be sharing specific challenges that they're facing in their own interdisciplinary migration research for their PhDs. Um, the panelists are then going to provide a bit of commentary on these presentations, and then I'll invite the audience to use the chat box to con contribute your thoughts and questions that we can either direct to the panel on your behalf, or if you want, you can indicate in the chat box that you'd like to ask a question yourself, and I can invite you to do that, and you'll need to unmute your microphone um, at that time. So in the meantime, if you can keep your microphone switched off, um, also note that we're recording the meeting for those who aren't able to attend. It will be available online uh, later, so if you feel more comfortable, you can switch off uh, your videos, but it would also be nice for our speakers to have some friendly faces, um, especially during the discussion, so don't be too shy. Um, you can tweet about the event using hashtag NextGenMem and hashtag conversations about, and we can post those in the chat box for you over the course of the talk. Okay, so without further ado, I will introduce very briefly our panelists. I'm not gonna go into too much detail in the interest of time, um, but you can read all about them and their amazing careers on the Eventbrite page, as I'm sure many of you already have. So we're very lucky to have Professor Joy de Moussi here with us today. Joy is the Director of the Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences at the, and the Director of the Research Centre for Refugees, Migration and Humanitarian Studies, both of them at Australian Catholic University. Joy's research crosses the boundaries between history, migration, humanitarianism, emotions, and more. And so your insight today, Joy, is gonna be extremely valuable. Uh, thank you also for joining us, Associate Professor Finex Onshofu from the University of New England in Armadale. Finex's work crosses the discipline boundaries of migration studies, linguistics and education, and more recently, decolonial studies as well. So we're very much looking forward to hearing what you've got to say today, Finex. Last and by all means not least, we have Dr. Agnes Sabo joining from the, uh, from the University of Wellington across the pond in Aotearoa. Agi was awarded a Rutherford Discovery Fellowship by the Royal Society Te Aparangi for her research. And Agi's research focuses on intersecting areas of health, aging and immigration. So learning about your experiences building your career in this space, Agi is gonna be really useful today. I will introduce Hal, Carl and Marina a little bit later because I think we're probably sick of hearing my voice by now. So I might just pass straight over to you, Joy, mm -hmm. uh, and we can learn about your experiences of conducting interdisciplinary research. Thanks, Charlie. And thank you for the invitation to speak today. It's a great privilege and a great um, 
delight to be talking to you about interdisciplinary research and particularly around migration studies. Um, as Charlie mentioned, I work at the intersection of many sort of methodologies and um, approaches, and I'll talk a little bit about them throughout my talk. Um, but what I wanted to do today was really raise four areas, I think, that um, seem to me constant challenges uh, for all of us as we, as we work in this space. So I'll just go through these. I've got eight minutes and I wanna keep within that given the um, program today. And some of these come up actually in the um, presentations by the PhD students. So I'm interested that we're all sharing some of these questions. So the first challenge, if you like, that I've pitched, um, if, if, if for want of a better word, is simply finding your voice. Now, if we think about, you know, applying methodologies and theories and why we do it and how we do it, it is to find our own voice to establish our point of departure in the literature, to make it a distinctive voice, obviously, but to engage more broadly with our scholarly colleagues. Now, I know this sounds very simple and people say, well, of course, we find our own voice, we've got our own voice. Well, I think actually when it boils down to it, that is the hardest thing because there are, as we all know, a menu, menus, extensive billions of menus of theories and methodologies that can be applied to the work we do. And um, I think one of the challenges we have is which methodologies guide our research, which theories. So selection is really interesting. And I find too, sometimes you might miss a whole body of work. Um, you know, give a paper and someone says, oh, don't you know about that theory or that methodology? You think, gosh, you know, I thought I had covered everything. Um, so I guess what's fundamental is to keep this front and centre because I find with some of my own students as well, um, the focus on concepts, obviously that drives what we do and in our interpretive structures. But ultimately you have to keep front and centre um, in, your, in your sites. What are the questions you want to answer? You know, what, what, what is it you want to say and how are those concepts going to help you develop those arguments? Now, I think some of the questions a PhD students raise later come to ultimately come back to this. What is it you want to actually talk about and say? Now, I think um, just to talk a bit about my own research, so I'm currently writing a book on child refugees and humanitarianism in the 20th century. And the categories there are multiple, as you can imagine, children, refugees, humanitarianism, agency, gender, violence, uh, you name it, trauma, it's in there. Um, and I guess my experience in writing this book, which currently is around 200,000 words, so it's kind of really big, is um, it takes a while. It does, it's not something to rush and to consider developing your arguments in relation to methodologies is uh, a, a slow burn at times. So I'll, I'll leave that point there though, because I can see I've already got three, I've already spoken for three minutes. Um, the second one is in order to be interdisciplinary, you have to have a discipline. Now I can go on about this topic, but I just want to put that out there. I drew on concepts of trauma, of grief, emotional communities, the child, transnationalism, and more recently turbulence um, and looking at turbulence studies, which is something I'm developing with some colleagues from engineering. We all bring our, uh, our kind of energy and um, engagement to these, to our projects through our discipline. Now, um, again, I think this is really important because while we're all interdisciplinary scholars and that is, that is fundamental to what we do, it doesn't work in a vacuum. And this is something we can we can talk about at, at question you know further in the discussion. Uh, and when you're looking and developing your overarching interpretive framework, that is informed by methodology, obviously in theory. But what will help there, I think, when people come up against some challenges, is the dis disciplinary framework in which you are ultimately coming from. Now, again, that's quite controversial. Some people say they do not have a discipline. I don't believe them. Um, because we start from somewhere, we're born academically at a, at a place. Now, some people might uh, challenge that, right? Not like that. But I think the discipline also comes into play here in the interdisciplinarity of, that we do and in the, in the conversation 
between discipline and interdisciplinarity. Um, so I'll just again leave that point there. The third point I wanted to raise was, and this is something that does come up a bit later on, I think, I think the methods and concepts we use um, are, are complex and multiple and they cross disciplines. And in my experience, for example, working with trauma, that concept, which is probably in all the disciplines in the humanities and social sciences, um, it's fundamental, I think, as scholars that we understand the meaning of those terms in the disciplines that use them. And I say that because um, it's, you have to be, I think, very clear about which components of a concept or methodology you are drawing on. Because in a concept like trauma, for example, psychologists use it, um, historians use it, literary scholars use it, sociologists use the word, but often they use it in very different ways with very different meaning. It's quite extraordinary. But I think the third thing I'd want to say, just working with a whole range of concepts, is be across it. I know it's stating the obvious, but be across it in its multiplicity and complexity because people will say, well, in my field or where I'm working, that doesn't hold or you've ignored X in, in say, for example, trauma and trauma studies is a massive field. So I think thoroughly understanding the methods and concepts you're using, I think is really important. Now, that can be quite challenging because it, then you are having to select what aspects of that category you're going to apply and defend it as it were. But I think that's really important. And the last point I wanna make is just, just coming back to questions of impact publishing and careers. And I think this is really important when we're looking at interdisciplinarity because there are challenges, right? I mean, um, you know, journals are very much defined still by uh, a specialised discipline. Um, obviously in this field, there are a number of journals and certainly publishers who are publishing and um, interested in material that does go beyond the discipline. But I guess here, when putting in for um, grants, but also submissions to publishers and journal, journals, thinking about who your audience is. And I think audience is the last point I'll make here. Um, there are different audiences, obviously, for all the work we do. And I think you just have to be mindful of that. So if you want to put your article um, on a certain topic with a certain approach to a journal, making being confident that that journal um, you know, is interested in that, will take that on. I mean, too often, and having been a journal ed editor myself, people will miss, miss the mark, right? It won't be the right journal. And I think with interdisciplinary work, especially in migration, um, while some journals say they are interdisciplinary, they're, they're not as interdisciplinary as others. So I think there are challenges there. But again, coming back to this fundamental question about audience, um, you know, who do you want to speak to? Who do you want your material to be read by? And just finally, um, we all know that there is a massive public interest in migration. So it's a very dynamic and very exciting field. It's very topical. So I can't, I think that it's a great, there's great future in this research. Um, and I think keeping, um, keeping on top of new, new methodologies. So methodologies we have yet to hear about in the future um, is I think the key to continuing to publish and thrive in this field. Thank you. So I will stop there, Charlie. And I think it's just gone nine, eight min nine, nine minutes. Nine minutes. You were yeah, a little bit over, yeah. but we won't penalise you too yeah. much for that. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Joy. That was that was really interesting and very reassuring. And also, we have one of our HDR students talking about kind of some new methodologies as well. So that's that's quite a nice point um, to set us up with. So, uh, Finex, would you like to uh, take the floor? No, I'm, I must start by saying that uh, my training is in linguistics, so that's my field of training. And I'm a self-taught uh, migration studies uh, researcher, all other fields, it's self-taught. My PhD was all in linguistics. So what I'm trying to do here is to try and, uh, maybe I'm preaching to the converted as it were, but just to try and emphasize why interdisciplinary research is important and necessary. And I'm saying interdisciplinarity is really not a slogan or an option, but it is something that we must do. So I have a few propositions here that I'm throwing in here just to get the discussion 
going. So the first point um, I would like to highlight here is that uh, interdisciplinarity is a necessary epistemological posture that helps us to speak to the complex yet interconnected problems that we face in society. Um, it's necessary for us to adopt an interdisciplinary approach because uh, like migration studies and any other fields really, they cannot address sufficiently the complex issues we are facing in society, particularly if we tend to be ring fence in our disciplines and adopt an insular kind of an approach. It's not sufficient enough for us to, to address the challenges we are confronting in society. So my argument here is that uh, we are better off working together, collaborating, co-constructing knowledge and not competing with one another because the most exciting and impactful work happens at the meeting point of disciplines. Um, this is the site for cross-fertilization, exchange and sharing of ideas, theories, concepts and methodologies. So what I'm just saying here is that interdisciplinarity is something that is necessary for all of us to um, adopt. So I'm going to tell a story here. So my presentation will be a little bit narrative telling my personal story about key challenges and solutions when conceptualizing, implementing and reporting interdisciplinary research um, on migration and other spheres. So here are some, some of the challenges that I have uh, faced um, throughout my career. The first one is about uh, the normative assumptions practices and habits about disciplinary boundaries. Um, um, the, the story I'm going to tell here is about my PhD about 15 years ago. Um, I did my PhD at Monash and I was in the discipline of linguistics. So I almost lost my confirmation of candidature because uh, the conceptual framework for my PhD rested on uh, Antonio Gramsci's hegemony theory and uh, critical discourse analysis. These were not well known within the field of linguistics at the time. And so one of the panel members told me that, uh, well, it doesn't seem like you belong to linguistics because these frameworks have nothing to do with linguistics. Fortunately, there was a, a one um, member of the panel who was across those ideas. So she stepped up and uh, rescued my PhD as it were. So I have been an interdisciplinary scholar from just with my PhD starting and that's one experience I had in terms of their people's perceptions about interdisciplinary research and uh, the tendency to focus on the methodologies of uh, a discipline and not moving out. And another recent example here that uh, which illustrates the problems we face as interdisciplinary researchers is about how to navigate disciplinary conventions and practices. So I had an article that came out about a month ago in Transmodernity Journal, because I'm used to the APA style manual and this journal insists on MLA and they were insisting on the eighth edition. So I found myself spending more time trying to work on issues to do with the style and more time than I spent actually writing the paper. So it's a challenge you face as well. Another challenge is in terms of managing research team dynamics. So I started a book project in 2009, and that project ultimately, it's an edited volume, it was ultimately published in 2018. This was because in the team of contributors, there were people who, were, who had different work ethics. And so that held everything back. So it was a long delay, the project was interdisciplinary. So there's a challenge there that you face in, in the sense that uh, some members of the team may not be working as well as other team members are doing. So you are held back by that. And another thing that I would want to throw in here on point four there, what I think are inflexible national and local institutional demands. We know here in Australia, we, we use what are called uh, field of research calls uh, for era reporting purposes and uh, there are also some local institutional admin structures that put us into disciplines. So fitting into those can be a challenge if you are an interdisciplinary scholar. Where do I situate my work? Does it get reported under code 2004 for linguistics 
or it gets reported under the field for sociology or under the field for politics. So that's another challenge you may find. But having said this, I think we must accept that uh, these structural issues do exist and that we must find ways of working both within and without them. So here are some possible solutions. Um, so I'm drawing on the work that exists in this space that we need to acknowledge and confront the fallacies of, of certainties and completeness. So I am talking about why it's important for us to get out of our disciplines and drawing on the work of people like Francis Nyamjo who talks about uh, ontologies of incompleteness that every discipline is incomplete on its own. It only tells us part of the story. So we need other disciplines to tell a complete story. And uh, Latin American scholar De Souza Santos, who is uh, um, a decolonial theorist, talks about ecologies of knowledge, why it's important for us to draw from multiple traditions of knowing. And there's work by Emmanuel Wallerstein, who talks about uncertainties of knowledge, that every body of thought really must be seen as not complete, and therefore the world is uncertain. So we must draw on so many uh, traditions, that's interdisciplinarity. Here, I will differ a little bit with Joy in terms of what she said about disciplines, that uh, I believe that uh, an undisciplined academic, uh, that concept is not a dirty word. Disciplines are meant to discipline you into narrowly conceived conventions. And for me, I think this may drain you of your profundity and creative abilities. So personally, I believe we shouldn't shy away from breaking out of disciplines, crossing into other areas, and thereby being interdisciplinary. Um, the other suggestion I'll throw in here is that be a little smart when you are getting into research teams and working in projects that are collaborative. Um, negotiate responsibilities, avoid being held back by team members with different work ethics. A key point here that ties in with what Joy said is uh, that uh, we need to uh, write our stories into our research. Like I'm a migrant um, and I'm not going to let someone else tell my story. So autoethnographic approach, I will write my story into the work I do. Um, I'm not going to go through the next slide because uh, time is out unless you allow me a little bit of uh, maybe 30 seconds um, so my experience uh, with working in disciplinary space is interdisciplinary space is that uh, it's a steep learning curve at first due to the way we are trained, the monoepistemic training. But I found working across multiple fields quite rewarding and productive because they all draw on different theories and methodologies. So you need to be open-minded, be prepared to learn new and strange ways of doing research that may otherwise be outside of your primary field of training. Now about publishing quickly, I think uh, there are some discipline specific conventions that constrain, but these must be followed. Be prepared to move out of your comfort zone and read material outside of your field of primary training. You also need to surround yourself with a team of senior experts, both within and outside of your discipline open your work to the scrutiny of peers, junior and senior alike, before sending it out to publication. If a journal rejects your manuscript, which is more often than not, but on unjustifiable grounds, do not give up. Try another outlet. Target those high impact journals that are open to interdisciplinary scholarship. Because for me, I think some journals are like cows. They will never deviate from their normative prescriptions, even if it means knocking back cutting edge research. Um, yes, this is the last point. Thanks. Um, I think I went over by a minute or so. So you did a little bit, yeah. But thank you so much, Finex. Some really interesting points there um, and solutions as well, which we can delve into a little bit more deeply in the QA. Um, so Argy, would you like to take over with your presentation now, please? Um, Kira Koto Katoa, I'm greetings to you all from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, I would like to start by thanking Charlotte and Tasa for inviting me to be part of this discussion. I'm very humbled to be included in this panel and 
I hope that at least some of what I share with you today will resonate. Um, as the most junior of the panelists and still a relatively early career academic, um, I have organized my, my brief presentation around two related topics. One is planning a career as an interdisciplinary researcher and um, also how to acquire um, funding uh, for interdisciplinary research. Um, when I first started to think about this, it seemed like a really easy thing to do. I'm like, yeah, I've been there. I'm an interdisciplinary researcher. I just talk about my um, experience. Um, then I looked at um, the schedule and um, the student presentation abstracts. And quickly I realized that actually we all have very different journeys. My journey as an interdisciplinary researcher is probably quite different to Joy's and Phoenix's, and certainly uh, Maria Howe and Carl will have also very different paths. So it made me think about who is the interdisciplinary migration researcher really, because we all have different backgrounds, we come from very different disciplines, and at least in my experience, most people don't start out as interdisciplinary researchers. It's not something that, you know, you major in at the university, right? Like you, you go to university, you study different disciplines. Um, and then we end up doing interdisciplinary research because we have complex questions that require complex solutions and input from multiple theoretical frameworks and the use of a wide range of methodologies. And sometimes, like in my case, uh, we become involved in interdisciplinary research just by chance. So I did all my training in psychology from undergrad through master's and then um, PhD. Uh, I did my PhD on, um, in cross-cultural psychology, looking at the experiences of migrants and how um, migrating to a foreign country impacts people's identity and sense of self. And uh, after finishing my PhD, I needed a job. And I applied for a lot of different positions um, in psychology. And then this one opportunity came up to do a postdoc in aging research and health research. I didn't know anything about aging or health, but I had some of the method skills that they needed for the job. So I applied and I got the job. And um, suddenly I was an aging researcher and I was doing health research. So um, I guess the message from at least my experience is that um, often to be successful in this field, we need to be able to navigate uncertainty. The precarious nature of academia requires us to be flexible and it requires an ability to adapt. And for me, it meant that I had to take a job outside of my field. I had to take a 180 degree turn in my research to explore a completely different field, to learn new theoretical frameworks, to shift my research focus. And this is definitely not something I ever planned to do, but I took the job because I needed a job and I just decided to adjust. I spent the first few weeks to derive a new plan regarding how I'm going to turn this to my advantage. And early on, I realized that there was this amazing gap um, in this area, unique opportunity to create an interdisciplinary line of research that combines health, gerontology, and migration to answer some really complex questions about migration and aging and to contribute to policy making. And I was very strategic from that point. I needed to build myself up as an aging researcher. I had to strategically develop my network in the area. I had to publish enough so people will know who I am. And it took me a couple of years to get there and establish myself enough to launch my own research project on um, aging migrants. So for me, planning a career is a balancing act. You need to be strategic, but also when an unexpected opportunity knocks on the door, you have to grab your chance. And um, in my experience, going out of my comfort zone and making some risky choices um, helped me get to where I am today. It got me a permanent academic job, 
our growing track record, a million dollar research grant. So undeniably, this was the best decision I've ever made for my career, even though I've never planned it. So that's kind of, that's my story. And I know not everyone um, shares the same story, but for me, that was a really important moment in my career to just dive into it and, and take some risks and grab opportunities. Even, even if it's not planned, it can lead to something really, really amazing. And um, this really brings me to my second topic, which is acquiring funding for interdisciplinary research. Um, and my first advice is uh, just apply for funding because the only way to get funding is by applying for it. So you have to, your name has to be um, in the hat to be considered. So uh, just really a thought of encouragement, please just always go for it. Um, and, but I think doing interdisciplinary research is quite an advantage and funding agencies love it. I mean, it's one of those buzzwords right now, like doing innovative, translational, transformative, interdisciplinary research. But, you know, it, it, while it sounds like a really exciting thing, it's actually quite difficult sometimes to position yourself and, and promote your research. And I think that might resonate with what Joy was talking about. So for me, it was actually quite a challenge to find the right audience. So who am I talking to? Whose language am I speaking? I was always going for psychology related funding because that was my discipline, I thought, um, and I was unsuccessful. And then I had to really kind of change my frame of thinking around how I go about funding and who am I talking to and, and who will see the, the really the value in my approach. And then I started to go for more social science, sociology panels um, when applying for funding. And suddenly I was all successful because those were the people who could actually appreciate the knowledge uh, and, and the approach that I was bringing to migration research. So again, that was all about adapting and, and, and being flexible. Uh, another lesson for me was finding kind of how to position myself or who I was uh, as a researcher. I have many identities. Um, as uh, someone who works at the crossroads of disciplines. Um, so yeah, with, with many academic identities, it can be sometimes a bit challenging to, to tell people who I am um, and, and, and find an identity that works um, for me. And uh, just a final point is, yeah, find the right people to work with. Um, Interdisciplinary research requires teamwork often, and especially if you want to go for big funding. So yeah, fi find the people that you can work with um, I, and that makes the whole process so much easier. And I think I've run out of time, so I'm going to stop here. Thank you so much, Agi. Really interesting points and great, and so great to hear you speak so kindly of your own career and how being flexible has really helped you kind of land that interdisciplinary uh, interdisciplinary career. Um, so now we've had some great insight here. We might actually be able to start workshopping some of this advice and, and challenges that you presented um, as we try and support how Carl and Marina with the challenges that they're facing in their PhD research. Uh, so how would you like to kick us off with your presentation? Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. And Hao Zeng is from the Alfred Deakin Institute for Citizenship and Globalization at Deakin University. And she's early on in her PhD research, which is entitled Chinese Lesbian Students, Queer and Adult Identity Making in Australia. Hao's beginning to grapple with uh, some conceptual and theoretical challenges at this stage of the work, which hopefully she's going to talk about now. Can everybody see my screen now? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, uh, so good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Hao Jen and just started the second year of my PhD program at Deakin University. The concept of transience emphasizes the complexities and tensions in my PhD research across migration, youth, and queer studies. In this project, I explore how Chinese lesbian students might question conventional pathways of adulthood, uh, migration, and queer identity making to reconfigure their transitions in Australia. <clears throat> so, <laughs> 
These are two pictures of me uh, in 2014 and 2021. On the left one, you can probably see all my roommates and I have the same hairstyle as our school required. And here are we, uh, we are in 2021. I'm proudly standing in front of a rainbow beach box in Melbourne as a queer young woman wearing boat rallies. When you look at these two photos, you might think, wow, such a big transition. By definition, transition often implicitly refers to transferring between two different categories. And in many people's understanding, there have been many recognized milestones along the pathway to young people's transitions, especially young women's, such as completing, completing school and having a job, um, settling down with heterosexual partner, or even getting married. For many Ch uh, Chinese lesbian students aged between 18 and 25 studying in Australia, the milestones we are striving for or um, have achieved can be much more complicated and very different. Our transnational mobilities reinforce the instability and question the idea of settling down. Our non-heterosexuality may critically challenge the heteronormative social scripts in intimacy and migration and initiate non-linear and complicated self-making while negotiating over conventional ways of transitions. Closely capture and examine what happens in Chinese lesbian students' transnational transitions, I want to use the concept of transience as a working concept to challenge the heterodominated and stage-based models of transitions. The idea of transience suggests fluidity, uncertainty, and in-betweenness, which complicates the theorization of sequence timing and progress in young people's migration journeys, as well as their queer adult identity making. So to con consolidate this idea with more theoretical insights, I found two interdisciplinary conceptual frameworks paying direct attention to mobile youth and queer youth transitions. The YMAP project, which is a larger project on um, youth mobilities, aspirations, and pathways that my PhD project sits within draws on the concept of mobile transitions to frame a more comprehensive exchange between youth and migration studies in a global context. We also anticipate various interventions in research, such as a closer focus on intimate relationships and sexuality. And queer temporality challenges the socially ideal maturity and stability in adulthood. It questions queer youth's experience with time and space and explores how young queers interact with conventional markers of adulthood while querying their way of life. In this project, I wonder how the concept of transience can offer a more inclusive perspective and initiates more expansive thinking about youth mobilities and migration with the example of Chinese lesbian students in Australia. To address the theoretical challenges, um, I'm delving into these questions. First is how can I test the concept of transience empirically in fieldwork and analytically incorporate this idea in my data analysis? How does the concept of transience engage or challenge our conceptual thinking in Chinese lesbian students' transition in a transnational context? And how would different disciplines approach transience methodologically and theoretically. More specifically, um, how can transients bring different conceptual frameworks together in this project to examine and theorize Chinese lesbian students' narratives about their transitions and possibly add more meanings to the previously understanding um, of the, about this specific cohort. For example, self-representation, self cultural adaption processes, social networks building and maintenance. So here are the references and thank you so much for listening. You can find me through email or Twitter and your comments and questions will be much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hao. What a wonderful presentation and some really interesting questions that you've posed there. Um, so hopefully we can get some answers uh, throughout the course of this event. Um, now we'll hear from Carl Anison, who is a PhD candidate at Griffith University. Carl's research is called Negotiating Identity, Musicality and Translocality of Filipino Migrant Musicians in Australia. 
Carl's had some practical challenges when conducting his research that I think we're going to hear about from him now. So Carl, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Charlotte. And of course, Tasa, ma'am. Uh, can you hear me all right? It's good? Cool, thank you. So yeah, greetings from the Gold Coast, Australia, Queensland. Yeah, uh, so my research is, um, my PhD research explores um, the Filipino migrant musicians and how they perform uh, and negotiate their creative identity and labor while maintaining their own Filipino-ness or Filipino identity in the creative and multicultural environment of Australia. Um, but for this presentation, I would like to focus on the interdisciplinarity and uh, two things, interdisciplinarity and the practical and methodological challenges of what I'm doing, as mentioned by uh, Charlotte. And of course, amid COVID pandemic, so I, I'm always uh, integrating COVID here because it really changed a lot of things, in, not only in research, but also in other aspects of our lives. So first, um, I'm looking into uh, identity negotiation of migrants, particularly through music and performance. Um, so in here, I put emphasis on the creative labor to focus on music and culture rather than economics and politics that are usually being discussed in um, labor and migrant studies. However, with, with the integration of labor also in my research and their experiences during the pandemic, um, I had to look into the politics and power, the concepts of power and politics again. Uh, and this relates to, for example, the Australian, how the Australian creative industry uh, looks after migrant musicians, especially during the pandemic. So this implies, for instance, that uh, I need to do some policy studies, which was not really part of the original proposal that I had. Uh, when I was making my PhD proposal, I was just thinking of music, you know, music, musicians, performers, but then, oh, now migrants. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And then third, of course, is looking into their musicality. And when I say, uh, or when talking about this, I need to integrate analysis of their musical practices, both, and this is both online and offline now because of the things that we are doing always online, which leads me to the second point, which is the methodological and practical challenges. Uh, this will be brief because, of course, there's a lot of methodological challenges, as mentioned also by the, the other um, presenters. So um, my research applies um, multi-methods. So there's interview, participant observation, uh, there's autoethnography also, and digital methods. So let me talk about them in some detail, but just uh, citing a few of them. So to gather data, I, I am doing primarily interviews to get um, conversations about their lives as migrants and of course as musicians. However, uh, with COVID, I was compelled to use technology like you know, Zoom, Facebook Messenger, phone calls to do the interview. And of course, each of this has its own challenge also. So to name a few, for example, um, Zoom is not as user-friendly as the others because uh, my respondents need to install Zoom on their mobile phones. And this is a hassle to them, of course. And um, however, they have Facebook Messenger, which is easier to access for, for everyone. Um, but you cannot record your, your interviews here. So I needed to be flexible and think about how to do this, of course, with the ethical implications also. Um, and I needed to understand how OBS and Audacity and all other programs work. Uh, thankfully, I have the time and resource and let's just say uh, cultural, uh, uh, yeah, cultural capital and technological capital to know these things. But how about other researchers who, you know, do not have these things? And in terms of participant observation, I originally planned to participate in performances as both an audience and part of the band or you know, performer. Uh, again, when it comes to COVID, the problem is you know, travel restrictions and gig cancellations, which you know, hindered me to do this. Instead, different approaches now are being done, such as uh, digital ethnography. For example, joining Facebook groups, um, following and being friends with the respondents, being friends and watching the performances as well as doing online ethnography myself. So performing and then understanding the dynamics of whatever is happening there. So a methodological shift also uh, was happening. So um, to summarize, you know, technological and personal challenges 
are apparent in uh, this kind of research, although uh, reflexivity and flexibility are um, allow me to be to be aware of these vulnerabilities as well as opportunities. I look at these things also as opportunity um, in doing interdisciplinary and uh, multi-method research in especially for um, e extraordinary circumstances. So yeah, thank you for listening. Perfect, thank you, Carl. Very interesting challenges that you've also been facing as well and some interesting ideas on, on how to overcome them through reflexivity. So we'll chat more about that. But now we have uh, Marina Khan, who is studying her PhD at the Institute for Culture and Society at Western Sydney University. Marina's research is called Mapping Migrancies, Analyzing Migration Trajectories Through Infrastructural Encounters. She's advocating for a new innovative kind of migration research agenda that involves mapping infrastructural domains. And this has posed some methodological challenges, uh, which Marina is going to kindly share with us now. Thank you, Marina. Awesome. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, are you able to see the slides as well? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. All right, so um, thanks Charlie and thanks Tazamem. Um, my topic as um, Charlie discussed is called mapping migrancies. Um, and it's kind of, um, it's based on this recent infrastructural um, turn in migration studies that um, is providing insights into the functions and different aspects of migration infrastructure. So I'm actually just going to kind of go through a quick overview, uh, disciplinary intersections, concepts and methodologies and off to the questions. So in current definitions of migration infrastructure, it consists of commercial migration industries, regulatory frameworks, social networks, technology, humanitarian processes. There is a gap, however, in exploring the multiplicity of all of these things and processes that are happening in individual migration trajectories. Uh, a single migration journey comprises of multiple infrastructural interventions. Uh, and my PhD project explores this gap by arguing for a new research agenda by mapping when, where, and how various migration processes are encountered and experienced by skilled migra migrants across digital and physical domains. So in terms of the interdisciplinary context, um, it intersects with migration mobility studies, digital sociology, geography, and urban studies, and also the emerging field of digital migration studies. Um, some concepts that I think um, might be, I guess, useful here are how I define skilled migration, infrastructure, and the encounter. So skilled migration is, for the purposes of the study, is understood as a trajectory which may involve a series of different types of skilled and non-skilled visas, rather than focusing strictly on policy categories that define migrants as skilled or unskilled. So in the study, participants self-identified as skilled, and they did not necessarily need to be on a skilled visa, but on a skilled migration pathway. Uh, migration infrastructure is understood in my case, both as the spaces, as well as the processes that migrants engage with um, when moving internationally. So spaces being the digital and physical spaces where processes such as visa submissions, applications, document translation, skill assessments, language tests, etc., happen. And the infrastructural encounter refers to migrants engagement with these processes, these infrastructures, and then encounters prompt responses, improvisations, negotiations that can be expected or unexpected, anticipated or unforeseen, or positive or negative. So the methodology adopted combines an analysis of popular internet migration forums where a lot of these sort of infrastructural discussions are happening um, with in-depth interviews involving migration maps sketched by 27 research participants based in Australia and Canada. Now I have included some of these maps here. So these are just maps that migrants uh, sketched and I think that they're quite unique and quite different. So. Um, they, they, I mean, even though they kind of illuminate these hidden infrastructures or processes of migration, they span across multiple conceptual uh, domains, incorporating geo uh, geographical aspects of scale, space, and temporality, along with effective and embodied experiences of migration. Uh, the other thing that I've got here is also this um, challenge to compare and contrast these in-depth qualitative findings with this quant kind of data extracted from online migration forums considering that they're also a key migration infrastructure within themselves with their own logics of operation. So in, in sort of displaying all of this, I'll just move on to the questions. Um, so what are, I guess, what I'm kind of, I guess, wanting to discuss is what are some of the ways or techniques to categorize all of these sort of visually represented data in mind maps and um, that comprise of sort of diverse and unique experiences and stories. Uh, but also consider the multiple conceptual themes that are emerging from them. So for example, skills and affect and memory. 
What are some of the ways of analyzing and writing about data that are produced by visual methods like mind maps? Because they often tell a larger life story, but also encompass moments or encounters that are thematically different from each other. And finally, what are some approaches to deal with the issues of diverging from disciplinary boundaries, something that we've already been discussing uh, now? So for example, in my case, using mind maps alongside big data provides examples of both in-depth and collective experiences of migration, but also very different theoretically. Finally, I've got some sort of considerations that I'm working on and might be embedded into my chapters. Um, so how do infrastructural encounters produce skillness? That is the role of infrastructure that play, uh, in, in playing and becoming, in negotiating skilled status. The effective potentialities of infrastructural encounters and how they impact states of feeling in different phases of the migration journey. And finally, their role in the future oriented practices and aspirations of migrants, such as um, ongoing mobility, reconnecting with family or return migration. And that is all for me. Thank you. Wonderful presentation. Thank you, Marina. Um, so we've heard three very different projects, um, you know, facing some very different challenges, but I think they do resonate with some of the key themes that the panel raised in the first part of the event, particularly um, falling into interdisciplinarity, managing and overcome normative frames of reference in particular disciplines, and pre presenting interdisciplinary research to a particular audience. How, how can we do that? Um, so this is the part where we turn to the panelists to comment on the challenges that Hal Carl and Marina have outlined for us. Um, and audience, I can see there's already a lot of interaction in the chat box, which is great. And we'll try and bring in some of your comments and questions in this section as well. Uh, so I wonder if we start with some general thoughts um, from the panel before taking a look maybe at some of those specific questions that the students have posed. So Joy, would you like to first um, comment, you know, what are your first kind of thoughts? <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I just want to say thanks to um, the speakers, all of them presenting such rich material, actually, um, really exciting research, rich material, great, great work, um, hugely important, um, you know, scholarly, in a scholarly sense, but also just in terms of, you know, engagement in the community. I mean, these are really vital questions. So just want to put that front and centre. I think um, I think it's interesting because it, to me some of the questions the questions that each of the um, presenters raise do come back to um, the questions and answers um, that you're trying to develop in your thesis. So I'm trying to I'll go back to how um, just briefly if I could um, and how you use these concepts. And thank you again, Hal, for an extraordinary. Um, presentation. I mean, this is amazing work and so important um, in terms of scholarly contribution, but, but, but generally in terms of cutting edge research. So I thought your question there, how do you incorporate transience in this study rather than a, as a prevailing assumption, you want to create it as a working concept. Now, I think those two distinctions are really interesting. You know, rather than a, an assumption you're making, you want to create it as a working concept. Now, what I've put there, again, just in terms of approach, can you think about counterexamples to your argument? I mean, this is something we're all challenged by, right? And I think all the speakers raise that. You know, you've got a concept, you've got an argument, you want to pre present it like that. What are the counter arguments? And, and I think this is where interdisciplinarity can be incredibly powerful and work really productively, but it can also be an enormous challenge. So, um, you know, um, I'm, I'm not challenging how's um, you know, um, arguments or, or, or methods or anything, as I said, I think it's fantastic research. But if I were to come and say, well, actually, you know what, there might be communities in the Chinese lesbian student community that are not transient, that aren't sort of transnational. So how do you, how do you deal with that? I mean, are you excluding those people uh, or that category? Uh, it, and, you know, you can say you are, or you can say uh, you're gonna just focus on the transnational aspect and that's totally fine. But my question would be to you, like in terms of what we're talking about today, um, is there enough in your study to accommodate groups that are not what you're interested in pursuing? Um, now, you know, I think each of the speakers raised these directly and inadvertently actually. Um, and I think this comes back to how we use the, uh, the concepts we're using. Um, 
and and what arguments we want to put forward. But I, anyway, I, yeah, that was just something I wanted to kind of put out there. But it's really about how we're using those concepts from different disciplines. Um, and again, something I raised earlier, being across how the meaning, their meaning. I think transience works differently in different contexts. I won't talk about all the papers, but we can come back to that. I'll, I'll hand it over to the other presenters. Thank you, Joy. And how perhaps you can think in, on that on those points and then we can have a bit of a response as well afterwards. So Finex, would you like to, to make any broad kind of observations or comments? Okay, um, so maybe I will start like on a more like a general comment um, in terms of uh, how you can operationalize the key concepts that underpin your project. And I think for me, really, everything has to be driven by your data. I think the data set you are dealing with should drive the way in which you are applying those concepts. Because often we tend to try and manipulate the data such that it speaks to the concepts. But in my view, I think it has to be the other way around. Your data may not necessarily lend itself to the concept you are trying to apply. And that doesn't mean then for me that the data is wrong. You see, there is this idea about uh, universality where we try to think that uh, concepts are universal and can be applied in every context to solve the problems. But my thinking is that uh, we need to go back to the foundational principles that it is the context that shapes and defines the way we then move forward. A concept, um, transience, for example, um, uh, the concept that uh, uh, how spoke about in her project, may lend itself easily in house project, but it may not apply to some other context or specific topic of research. So that's my thinking about concepts. So we need to look at the data set we are dealing with. What does the data tell me? How then should I apply the concept? So that's a more broad and general uh, perspective view I have about this. Um, and I think I was going to speak to the specific uh, questions raised by Carl, not because he's a boy, but like me, but because I think those questions really speak to um, some of my areas of specialism, which is uh, the issue around decoloniality, because you asked a specific question really, that uh, you are wanting to integrate decoloniality in your research, but you are not really sure where and how. And you also raise a question about, now that you are working in an interdisciplinary space, how do I highlight each discipline? How do I integrate you know, these multiple and sometimes diverse and competing approaches and methodologies? So I think this is where decolonial approach becomes relevant. Um, it takes a whole seminar really to talk about decoloniality, but I'll be brief here to say that uh, this is a school of thought that pushes for the recognition of multiple and diverse ways of knowing. So it is against like um, singular traditions or normative approaches that uh, look at a problem from a, a single perspective. So it, if you are to apply decoloniality, I think the most important thing you have to do is, first of all, familiarize yourself with uh, the body of scholarship in that area, um, which mostly comes from Latin America and other parts of the global south. It's, 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 a, it's a, 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 an approach really that is trying to, well, democratize is not a good word, but trying to get us to understand that there are multiple ways of knowing given the complexity of the research group that you are really looking at, there are multiple things that you are dealing with. And so decoloniality will be an approach that allows you to integrate all of these uh, seemingly competing um, aspects of your project, but they are not contradicting one another. It's only that possibly at the moment, 
you are looking at it with a singular lens. You need to open up to the idea that there are multiple ways and these Filipinos, they bring with them, you know, some traditions of knowing, different ways of uh, being. So that's about ontologies. So their experiences have to be written into your project and they can shape then the way in which you approach your data and analyze. So I think for me, really, it's about if, because we are talking about interdisciplinarity here. So if we are talking interdisciplinarity, it just doesn't have to end at the level of concepts or theories, but it has to move into the space of people's experiences and ontologies being can we tape into people's experiences and ontologies in making sense of our projects? What is it that we can learn by taping into the research participants' experiences and then you know, shape our projects that way? So that's all I can say for now. Um, yeah, I will leave it at that. Thank you, Finex. That's really interesting and, and would probably resonate across all you know, the presentations we've seen, this idea of challenging dominant frames of reference that we see in particular disciplines. Um, and as you're saying, drawing on the decoloniality research might be a good way to do that. Um, so Aki, did you want to make some, some points here? Yes. Um, just first of all, thank you to the presenters for sharing their amazing research. It's been really inspiring for me. Um, you do amazing work and it's so different to what I do um, which again leads back to this idea that we do interdisciplinary research but we do very very different things and use very different methodologies and integrate different disciplines as well um, but what really resonates um, with me which was really kind of covered in all three presentations but particularly in the questions how I was asking around you know, how, how we use concepts and, and how we integrate them into our research, especially some, some, some of the concepts that mean so many different things in different disciplines. And that's a challenge that I have um, in my work as well. And I think Joy has um, talked about that too. Um, and I, I feel like on one hand, it's important to kind of challenge some of those kind of conceptualizations put forward by particular disciplines. But at the same time, I often feel like I'm just going down a rabbit hole. Um, and like, where do I stop? You know, because I can't, I, I, like with concepts like transience, or I think Joy mentioned trauma, like th there are so many different ways people talk about it. And, and you know, what's it like, is, is it worth trying to challenge all these different um, ways of conceptualizing a particular concept. So in, in my work, uh, I have this problem with what it means to assimilate or acculturate. And it's just, yeah. And I, I pick my own battles. Um, and I think it's important that we challenge these concepts and ideas and, and, and have these discussions, but also in terms of what is practical for for your research and for your PhD work and, and for publishing, I think at some point, um, at least from my perspective, I just come to um, a way of thinking or conceptualizing um, issues or topics or, or concepts that um, are meaningful to me. And I feel that it's acceptable um, and, and while staying open-minded and, and constantly challenging myself as well. But I, I feel like you have to get to a point where you feel like this is, this is how I interpret this and this is how I conceptualize it and be really transparent about it. This is how I look at this in this piece of work. Um, but be, be open to receive criticism and, and, and to change your frame of reference over time. Um, and I think it's important to have these discussions and, and think about it. But practically, uh, you know, when you want to publish your work, you need to get to a point where like you can present your concepts and, and your theories. Um, yes. Um, and um, what else? Um, yeah, I really um, empathize with Marina around this huge challenge of mixed methods research. I do a lot of work with big data. And then also I do 
very individualized like narrative life course interviews of understanding an individual um, person's life experience and how do I you know integrate that with that big data um, um, that's a, I, f I feel like that's a huge challenge and it's really tricky when it comes to publishing that type of research and I think that there's a reason why people kind of separate them <laughs> and they package their research into into different articles because it's really tricky to bring them together because we use very different epistemologies and different ontologies. Um, I like to, even when I work with big data, I like to have a critical lens. So I, I, I try to use the same kind of critical uh, approach to my quantitative research that I use to my qualitative research. I still feel like I still need to question my assumptions and think about my positioning as a researcher, even when I'm just looking at this big data set, because there are reasons I'm looking at particular aspects of the data. There are reasons I visualize something in particular ways or I highlight a certain question in the data. There are reasons why we ask particular questions and measure certain things and not others. Um, so that's something that I've I found quite uh, helpful in my practice. Um, when it comes to publishing, um, I think it's still quite a challenge for for a lot of journals to to accept research that that really marries and integrates mm -hmm. these two different types of epistemologies. Yeah. Thank you so much, Agi. Did um, the students, do you want to comment on, on what's, what advice you've just been given? <laughs> <laughs> or any further kind of follow-up questions that you have? Um, okay, I'll go for it. So thank you so much for all your like honest um, sharing about the knowledge and experience, especially like it's really inspiring. And um, for Joyce, not question I would say, but uh, it's like a, like it's like a question I'm always receiving, especially at this very early stage uh, without my data. Um, but I think it's worthy um, in thinking about the concept at this moment because it helps me to have a, like a better mindset to um, mm -hmm. uh, like waiting for the field to start and thinking about what I'm gonna do and what can I get most from the data. Um, when I'm reaching to the analysis and uh, the later stage. So um, so that's my kind of answer, why it's like a working concept. Mm. And I'm really trying my best to avoid like it's a prevailing assumption because mm. as you said, probably I will find like a counter argument from mm. like, some of the participants' narratives. And mm. uh, I'm, I will be really happy with it because mm. Um, I think it's raised a point it's like we shouldn't like um, making the stereotypes of everything. So it's always um, different narratives, different experiences, like our projects. So I'm really looking forward to it um, this year. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's great. Thank you, Hal. Yeah, I'll, I would also like to say thank you to, to Joy, Aggie and uh, Finex. Um, yeah, just um, about the decoloniality thing. Um, I know that's that's kind of difficult to do actually, because it's again another you know another challenge to to read all of those things on top of whatever I'm reading about mm. migration, mm. music, mm. performance, identity, and all those things. But of course, um, I post this the, the, that particular question because I, I really wanted to see. I never saw any. Filipino series, for instance, or academic, raising mm. this kind mm. of questions about this particular topic or even interdisciplinary topic that I'm doing. So uh, I would like to do something about it. So <laughs> yeah, but but that's mm. I know that's a difficult journey, and uh, I the thing is I just don't know where to put it next in my chapters. So uh, I've been thinking about the chapters. Um, I've been doing my data gathering for how many? Uh, months now still continuing i don't know when to stop though <laughs> no, but yeah um that's the thing now but but uh yeah so when writing my chapters 
I'm thinking of just writing another chapter about that and integrating my way of knowing things and my yeah. participants' experiences about whatever they are experiencing as migrants, as musicians, yeah. and as workers in uh, Australia, which is a different experience also when you talk about migrant laborers and creative laborers in Hong Kong or yeah. in, in wherever. Mm. So I think that's one of the challenges, but uh, an interesting one. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I quickly comment there, um, uh, Charlotte, if it's okay? Um, yes. Uh, maybe one thing that you might want to do, uh, Carl, is to go back to your conceptual framework if you have one. And I think that's where you can articulate um, your approach to the project and bring in how decolonial thinking is helping frame the approach you are taking to your data analysis and making sense out of it. It will help reconcile because your examiner, when they look at your analysis, they may find that the analysis doesn't align with what they expected because they thought this should be this kind of an approach. But if you spell it out from the conceptual framework, to say my framework of analysis is informed by this particular approach, then I think your examiner will understand why you are using your participant stories and your own personal story to make sense of all of these things because that's what decoloniality tells us. We have to be open to multiple interpretations and analyses and understandings of life and what it means to be. You know, that's what decoloniality tells us. So we are all trained. I was trained in a um, Western normative tradition. And then I was self-taught in decoloniality. And looking back, sometimes I just laugh at the things I was told that this is what research is supposed to be. And when I realized that if I were to follow that trajectory through and through, I don't think I would have been able to uh, do some of the work that I have done so far, because it's about being open-minded, open to uh, multiple possibilities, you know, of approaching these things. Western thought is great. We, most of us are trained in that, but it's not the only way of knowing. There are multiple other ways of knowing. And in saying this, I'm not trying to shoot down the Western tradition of knowing. All I'm saying is, it's just one of the multiple ways of knowing that we have. It's just one of the multiple global traditions of knowing. So decoloniality tells us it's not challenging anything. It's just saying, can we open this space, bring onto the table of ideas and conversations other ways of knowing? Because you can't bring people from elsewhere and then want to subject them to a particular and narrow way of looking at things and say everybody has to be uh, look at things this way. They have multiple experiences and these experiences have to be recognized. And that will align very well, I think, with the theme of this conversation around interdisciplinarity. So interdisciplinarity is about multiplicity. So let's bring in all these diverse ways of knowing onto the table of what we're doing as researchers, your projects, your PhD projects. I mean, they can be pioneering uh, studies really that can um, help us see things differently from the way we used to. Thank you, Finex. That's very interesting. And Marina, did you have any comments you wanted to make? Yes, I wanted to thank uh, everyone who was uh, participating in this, who is participating here and for all of your comments. Um, I do I do agree, uh, Aggie, it is, it is quite uh, challenging to, I guess, work with mixed methods and publish in this, in this kind of um, study and I'm finding that quite tricky to write in my own thesis as well should this whole big data be one chapter and not be integrated in all of these other chapters but then I guess my initial thoughts were oh all of this is just going to work and it's going to come beautifully together um, in, in chapters um, and it's just it's, it's a very very tricky process and I think this is um, related to this question also by Satrio um, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right <laughs> Um, but about migrant network and, and temporality um, and how do you represent time visually 
um, because I think that that's something that I'm actually kind of dealing with right now. Um, the one thing that I think mixed methods do do is, I mean, because of the maps and the interviews and the big data, I have sort of three different understandings of time and temporality, for example, through through migration sort of journeys. And so I think that um, maybe maybe my, my approach for, for now has just been free writing about those reflections and reflecting on them in a very free writing style way, and then coming back to them um, and kind of um, yeah, working through sort of the conceptual aspects of them and, and, and conceptually sort of, I don't know, putting them together. So I think that's how I'm dealing with and uh, dealing with it. And because of because of those three things, there are three different ways to, I guess, look at it. Um, and it provides, I guess, some kind of triangulation. So I think that's that's one way to maybe deal with the visual sort of challenges of dealing with multiple things. And I hope I'm yeah, hope I'm answering that question. But yeah. That's that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. And I expect your answer will get even more kind of padded out as you go through that process as well. Um, Philomena, I can see you've got your hand raised there. Did you want to add something? Yes, if I may. Um, hi, my name is uh, Philo Philomena Murray. I know some of you already, and I have to say I am so impressed by all of you. Thank you for your presentations. Thank you for sharing the challenges um, of uh, researching in this area. Um, I'm director of CONREP and I've, I've put in the chat um, the details about how you can have a look at our website. We welcome um, blog articles, blog pieces from early career academics as well as from serious uh, older ones like Joy and Me, and um, also from PhD researchers. But we also are going to run a number of events this year on how to apply for grants and also how to think about publications. Um, I'm going to be talking particularly about how to apply for big fat European Union grants. CONREP is half a million dollars. Um, and to how to think about some really important theme that several of you have raised, and that is about working with teams, creating a team, how to manage a team, how to manage being in one, and especially for those of you who haven't been in one before, making sure you don't get actually overused as a member of the team. So we're going to be running some events on that. Conrep has an email, and I've put it in the um, chat function. So please feel free to contact us, and we will be very happy to, um, to invite some of you to participate. Um, actively as well as perhaps engaging as participants um, at listening and questioning um, but also we will we are preparing a set of agendas this year and zoom is a really good way of dealing with the disadvantages of um, COVID. So it means that we're engaged with more people than the seven universities engaged in our project much more actively than we would have thought. We would also be engaging with policymakers um, in both Europe and Australia about particularly appalling policies on refugees, um, as well as hoping to look for a few good news stories. So. Um, I really welcome you and I'd like to thank you all, but particularly I'd like to thank Charlotte, Charlie, for your absolutely fantastic organisation today. Thank you. Thank you, Philo. That's great. And some wonderful opportunities there to connect um, with Conrep, uh, particularly for the early career researchers. Whilst we're talking, taking questions from the audience, I noticed this one, which kind of brings us back to the practical um, aspects we were talking about um, in terms of publishing. So Satrio has asked, how do you think we should choose the right people, the right people as reviewers and examiners for our interdisciplinary research projects? So perhaps, yeah, John, I mean, could you speak to that? Thank you for the question. I mean, you've got to be strategic. I think strategic is the main word there. How do you be strategic? Probably through keywords in your synopsis. And um, when you put in, submit an article for, for publication, um, you, you're asked to nominate keywords or key, you know, concepts. So if you have a assessor in mind or a reader in mind, think about the, the keywords that will basically get to that assessor. Um, it's the same with grants. Um, when you're putting in a grant or part of a team, as Phil has there suggested, you know, thinking carefully and strategically about the key words you want to use to characterize your work and in interdisciplinary that is of course vital because as I said earlier you take any concept that we've talked about today and there'll be a multitude of people millions of people mm -hmm. who work on it from different angles and you do not want somebody who is not connected to the way you're using the word 
So I think you just have to be very strategic and very deliberative about how you um, construct your the narrative around your research. Let me put it that way. You know, in a snapshot. Thank you, Joy. And Argy, was that your experience when you were applying for the research grants? Oh, yes, absolutely. And um, um, I just know from my own experience, I'm an editor on, on a journal and, you know, mm. I would look at the reference list and see who are the people they are citing. Um, you know, can I find, like, is there like a pattern? Like if they are citing someone quite a lot, then I go down that route. Um, if, especially if if I get a, a manuscript that is kind of out of my area or I'm not very familiar um, with with the, the research um, topic, so um, so that's a that's a really really good strategy. And same for grants. I think it's so hard to find reviewers for 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 grants and even journal articles. So um, I know, like when I received. Um, reviews for one of my bigger grants I, I could just see the number of the reviewer it was like reviewer number 12 and they <laughs> are they needed two so it means that they had to ask at least 12 different people internationally before they found enough wow. um to review my application so um you know mm -hmm. if you can be strategic and put in those keywords and and, and cite the right people it's more likely that they will eventually. Agnew, that's absolutely right, and that's been my experience as well. Um, I just wanted to add there as a footnote, it's often, I mean, it's often, this is a bit naughty, but I, I've seen it done, that people will cite articles in that journal. So if you want to get into a particular journal, have a look at the journal and see what they've published in your field or your area and make sure you cite them so that you're telling the editor um, that uh, you're connected with the debates and discussions in that journal. Um, now, you know, you can argue about, about whether that's effective or not, but I know a number of people who will do that, right? They'll make sure mm. that... And so the editor picks it up and go, OK, well, they've been reading the journal, but they're speaking to our people. This is our hood, right? This is the kind of conversations we've been having. Um, anyway, that's another sort of practical bit of advice. Mm. Absolutely. Um, I've... That, uh, okay, you can go, Agnes. No, you go. You go. Okay. okay. You know, I was just saying, just to add on to what Joe is saying, not only that, from my experience, I've actually have had general editors asking me to say, can you please cite articles in our, you know, in the previous issue of the journal and then resubmit? So sometimes they can be that blunt. So it, it, they insist on that. I don't know about the ethical side of things. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, it does raise some questions <laughs> about that. Yeah, but if I may add still on that point of reviewers, um, yeah, we're looking at general articles here, but also the question I think has the part about choosing examiners um, for PhD projects. Um, um, I've supervised quite a number of PhDs and the last thing I would want to do is to set my students to fail by nominating an examiner that I clearly know that has a different um, perspective to these issues. You know, is not that they are wrong and not that my student is wrong, but there is a divergent view and approach, it's different. So I think, again, the word strategic is important there. Um, if my student is working on an interdisciplinary project, it would be futile for me to, say, to nominate an examiner who is not into interdisciplinary research because they will insist on wanting to see things done in just this particular way. And so you are setting your students to fail and yet your project might be groundbreaking. You know? So I think it's important as well, well for, um, speaking to senior people here who are supervising PhDs to not set our students to fail by choosing a wrong examiner really. We have to choose examiners who will understand the project from the perspective it has been formulated. But will I supervise a PhD on decolonizing the Anwan language project? I supervise that here at UNE, a, an indigenous student working on a project, decolonizing the Anwan language documentation program, right? And then I select an examiner who knows absolutely nothing about decolonization, who is not into decolonial theory. I mean, they wouldn't be do justice to that project. So it's important to be strategic about 
the choice of examiners, examiners who will speak the same language as the student. Yeah, you thank you, Fine. Understand the project, yeah. And kind of building on that and thinking about um, establishing your career as an interdisciplinary researcher, when we are choosing journal um, journals to publish in, is there, how do you guys approach this? Are you looking for discipline to have some kind of streamline of, of a discipline specific um, selection in, in your journal? So Joy, for you, are you looking to publish in some of the history journals to kind of establish that in, in your career? It, it really, it really depends, Shai. I mean, it depends on the material. Um, so I think I'm, I'm, I might have mentioned, but I'm working with engineers at the moment. And that, that raises another question about what we are talking about when we talk about interdisciplinary. Let me tell you, working with scientists is literally stratospheric, <laughs> if I can use that word. Um, and so I'm working with engineers at the moment and we just submitted actually an art, a journal, um, um, a sort of journal to a, a journal article to a journal. And there was a bit of debate about that, whether we'd put it in a science journal or a, or a humanities journal. In the end, we put it in the humanities one. And I guess, Charlie, to answer the short answer to the question is, looking at which journals have seriously published in similar, with similar material, I guess. Um, I mean, as it turns out in this case, it is a history one, but it didn't necessarily have to be. We were looking at where has there been work done in a similar way. And I mean, the topic is refugee boats and um, fleeing on the oceans and uh, displacement on the ocean. So the engineers have helped us with um, ocean engineering and looking at the um, oceans and from a scientific point of view, I won't go into it, but um, we had, I came upon a journal that looked at the, hist the oceans as a concept, as a category of analysis, uh, deconstructing the ocean. Now, again, that happened to be history one, but it didn't necessarily, you know, wasn't my criteria. It was where can we go where we think, just coming back to the question about assessors, where we think the assessors have worked, I looked at editorial board. Editorial board, there were people who actually worked on the deconstruction of the ocean from all sorts of perspectives, sociological, economic, historical, and I thought, great, hopefully it'll go to those people. And when I did a Google search, I did see oceans was an area they had published. So you've got to do the forensic work, actually, because a topic, a, an article like that could easily, dare, I hate to use the pun, could be sunk very quickly because people say, well, you know, not sure about this and it's bringing to two too many different methodologies at once that don't make sense. So the idea is to get the core topic, as it were, if I could use that word, and just do the editorial board look, search, see who's on it, and and yeah, that way. That's how we so did do, it. Do your research to know where to publish your research. Always do your research. Always yeah. do your research. There's no point in wasting people's time. As the, the editors will just come back and say, we don't do that. So it's really about looking at the board and the journal and putting in the Google thing about, you know, what is the word, the keywords again. And we came up with quite a number of journals that are uh, articles that have been published on oceans in that particular journal. So we've gone there, fingers crossed. We don't know this has just yeah. happened. So that's how we did it. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. And I've just noticed the time and mm. I wish we'd scheduled another six hours for this conversation <laughs> because, and there's been a few questions that we haven't been able to get to um, in the chat. So I might pose those questions um, a bit later to the panel members as well to have a think about um, and the comments that the audience have provided as well. And I would ask if, if the panelists who had presentations wouldn't mind sharing those PowerPoints um, with us and I can circulate those to the audience members as well. Um, I do want to end on a final word from our panellists, but just before we do that, I'll take the opportunity to thank Joy, Finex and Argie for coming today and sharing your candid, kind of honest insights with us um, about your experiences. Finex and Argie, we've got a small thank you gift on its way to you, courtesy of the Research Centre for Refugees, mm. Migration and Humanitarian <laughs> Studies. Thank you. And Joy, we have made a small donation to Oxfam on your behalf as a thank oh. you for your involvement as well. Right. For Hal, Carl and Marina, thank you so much for sharing your challenges with us today. I think it's really brave and generous of you and it helps us all to learn and grow as interdisciplinary migration researchers. You guys are the recipients of the inaugural TASA Next Gen Mem Interdisciplinary Migration Research Bursary, which is a bit of a mouthful. It's worth $500 each. And so we thank TASA for this generous support of HDR and ECR migration research. And we hope that the funds are gonna help you guys progress your work um, forward and help you get through some of these challenges you're facing. 
A big thank you also goes to Conrep who've contributed funds to have this session professionally produced as a video online so people can catch it again um, and think more on these amazing themes. Finally, the postgrad TASA MEM team, Heidi, Sarah, Ingwar, Claire and Laura, thank you for your support organising um, this event and we're very lucky um, to have some more events uh, underway, uh, so please watch this space for a little bit more from TASA's Next Gen MEM team. So now I'll leave the last word to our panellists, to whom I ask if you have one word of advice for interdisciplinary <laughs> migration scholars early in their career, what would it be? Let's start with Joy. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. Um, I, I would basically say, in, in a nutshell, be open and flexible to new methodologies uh, as they develop. As I said, there are no methodologies none of us have read about yet and none of us have encountered yet. They will come as we develop as academics. Um, and a number of the methodologies that are around today weren't around when I did my PhD 3000 years ago. So be open and flexible, but more importantly, I think, think about how your research can develop new methodologies, how you yourself can create a new methodology, not just be the uh, recipient and, you know, of one and, and one a person who engaged with it, but how your research can push forward new methodologies into the future as well, because that is the future of scholarship and knowledge. I'll leave it there. And, and thanks, my own personal thanks to Charlie for an extraordinary job. And to my fellow panellists, thank you. I've learned a lot. Thank you, Joy. Uh, Finex, would you like to give us your last word? Uh, just to thank you, Shelley, and everyone else. I mean, who has been involved in putting this together. It's I learned a lot as well. Um, my short advice to um, the students and other early career researchers, go back to my, to my first slide, that uh, interdisciplinary research is not a slogan or an option. It is something that we have to be committed to, be passionate about it. It's the way to go. So just be driven by that. You are more productive working in an interdisciplinary space than locked in a singular discipline. Or be open-minded, open yourself to multiple possibilities. That's how you can be productive, yeah. Thank you, Finex. And Agi? Um. My advice is just um, take risks. If you have if you have an idea, just follow it. Follow your gut. Like, be creative and 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 don't don't be afraid to take take risks because they can pay off. And um, sometimes those unexpected risky decisions can be the best things for your for your career. So, yeah, just um, just. Follow, follow your gut, that's my advice. And, and thank you, Charlie and Tasa and um, the panelists and um, all the presenters. It's been really amazing for me to be part of this and I've learned so much and uh, yeah, super exciting. Thank you very much to all our panelists and speakers today. Uh, goodbye, everybody.